Welcome back to another segment of Behind the Scenes. Thank you so much for being here. If you're enjoying these, please do hit like and subscribe. Today, I'm taking up a question from Up in Flames, who said, uh, there's another part of actor's lingo I learned, Q to Q. By the way, still anxiously awaiting for you to do a video on actor's lingo. So that's what I'm gonna do here today. I'm gonna take up a lot of the things that I guess I always take for granted because They've been part of my vernacular since I was a child, so I've just picked up these different sort of uh, words and phrases and learned what they meant sort of by experience. Uh, so let me share some of these with you. Uh, first of all, uh, it was mentioned Q to Q. Now, the correct spelling of Q to Q is C-U-E, as in it's a Q. Like you have a cue, an actor's cue. What is the cue line, The what the other person says? So a cue to cue, less than Q-U-E-U-E -U -E -E to stand in a line is the cue of C-U-E, cues, line cues. So a cue to cue then is going from one particular light cue uh, where on such and such a line, these lights change or this door opens or the sound effect happens. So that's that's what a cue to cue is in a rehearsal, a technical rehearsal for a theater production. So you are looking to rehearse for the technical crew, each one of the uh, actions that they're gonna have to take, whether it is a light cue, when, so-and-so comes center stage to sing their song. This spotlight's gonna hit them, so that's a cue. Or when this person says this line, the telephone's gonna ring. That's a special effects, a sound cue. So any of that, when we're doing those rehearsals, we are just rehearsing all of the technical things that are gonna happen. So we call it a cue to cue. It's not important for the actors to say all of their lines in between those cues. So if the lights come up and nothing's gonna change for six pages, there's no reason for the technical staff to sit through all of this extra dialogue because it is to rehearse those technical things. So that's a cue to cue. We use the term blocking, which basically means staging. So if you're going to block a scene, it means you're gonna stage it. You're gonna tell each one of the actors, work out where everybody's gonna move on what lines. So there are blocking rehearsals or on for film or television, you have a blocking rehearsal so that the camera people and everybody and the lighting people and everybody knows where the actors are gonna move. So then once that's established, then the crew can get to work lighting that and bringing in any other pieces of equipment and stuff so that we are ready to then shoot. Uh, another one that I'm focusing initially on theater. Uh, we have a term called an Italian. Uh, an Italian is a very fast read through without script <laughs> of everyone's dialogue. So once everybody is basically off book, so they're off book, this is the book, they have put their scripts down, they theoretically know all of their lines, then you might have a line reading, but at a very fast pace. Uh, so it's just literally for everybody to spit their lines out one after another, tighten everything up. Uh, we would often do those when I was doing runs of shows. Let's say we had Mondays off. So Tuesday before our show, while everybody was getting their hair and makeup put on and stuff like that, we would, within the dressing room sometimes, everybody was in their own dressing room, and we would just shout our lines out. So backstage, uh, we would do this Italian um, and that way, before we started the new week, everybody had a chance to refresh and make sure that if you had any moments when you had lines coming where you're like, oh shoot, that's my line, what is it? I don't remember. There was an opportunity to catch those before we actually started the week of shows. So, and sometimes in rehearsals when, <laughs> as a director, sometimes when we needed to do something technically, but we had all the actors there and they were waiting for us, we go, okay, just go over there and do an Italian uh, while we're finishing preparing for the rehearsal. Uh, so they serve a couple of different purposes there. Next one, uh, I mentioned this when I was talking about certain things in theater and what goes on, a sits probe. So 
Here's the definition in theater to describe a seated rehearsal where the singers sing with the orchestra, focusing attention on integrating the two groups. So it's really sort of the first opportunity for the musicians and singers to sing through the music, just sitting down together uh, without worrying about where people are going to be standing or what's going to be going on physically, just for the singers to be able to hear what the orchestra is doing and for the orchestra to work with the conductor and hear the singers. So again, integrating those two things. Uh, then a spike. A spike is a marking usually made with a piece of tape to indicate where a set piece needs to be put. So on the stage, any set pieces that are going to be moved, they'd put little X's or, you know, corner marks. You might put a little sort of, you know, mark like this. So this, this leg, this piece of furniture goes into that square. So that way, when pieces are being moved between sets, they get put in the right place so that the actors don't bump into the furniture and so that the lights, which have been set based on the furniture and set pieces being in particular places, the lights will all be correct. Sometimes those are done with glow tape so that in the dark, or as close to dark as you're gonna get, that whoever is moving those set pieces can actually see where it's gonna go because those, those pieces of glow tape, they'll shine like a flashlight on them so that they glow. And then when the lights go out, you can still see those. So those are the terms relative to specifically theater. In musical theater, the dialogue, the di anything that the actors say is considered the book. So you'll hear something about who wrote the book for that musical. That just means strictly the dialogue. And then the music is of course referred to as the music and lyrics. And each of these, it could all be the same person who did all three of these, or each one could be a different person, or the music could be the same person who wrote the music and the lyrics, or it could be two separate people. Another thing we hear in theater is the term swing. A swing is usually off stage. The swing is a multi-talented performer who's responsible for learning many ensemble pieces or characters so that they can swing on when someone is ill, injured, or missing the performance for any reason. So they are sort of an understudy for multiple roles. And often that's the case with dancers who are able to cover uh, multiple, multiple different characters or performers within a dance. So they have learned the choreographer, the choreography for a number of different uh, people that they can step in and do their choreography in a given scene. Another one is 10 out of 12. So some days in tech will be designated as 12 hour work days. So 10 of those hours are spent working with two hours allowed for meals and breaks. So when you get towards the end of rehearsal where you get into all the technical stuff and um, the dress rehearsal and the cue to cues and things when it gets down to the crunch time where a lot of things happen, we will often call those 10 out of 12 days to finish all the final preparations. You're only allowed a certain number of those during a re rehearsal period. So those are the theater and musical theater terms that uh, stuck out to me as things that you might not be familiar with, but words that you might have heard. All right, the next uh, lingo stuff has to do with writing. Uh, so writing scripts. Someone had asked me about a term called meet cute, which I had not heard and had to actually look up. So meet cute is a humorous or interesting situation in which two people meet that leads to them developing a romantic relationship with each other. Makes sense then, it's literal, meet cute, how they met in a cute way. An inciting incident is an inc inciting incident is the moment, event, or decision that thrusts the main character into the action of the story, also often known as the catalyst. The inciting incident is crucial for a story arc and usually happens within the first maybe 10 to 15 minutes of something, depending on how long it is. Uh, if it's only an hour long show, it's going to ha have to happen prior to the first 10 minutes. Usually it happens within the first scene or two. And those are those moments as an audience where we go, oh, wow, I know what's happening now. And that's literally what it's for. It's for the audience to know What's the story about? Sometimes like I'm watching something, I go, well, where's this going? Have you ever thought that? I don't get where this is going. 
the inciting incident is, incident is what tells you, ah, this is where it's going. And this is what the character is going to try to be resolving during the course of this story. So very key in storytelling. Exposition. Uh, exactly what it sounds like. Explaining something to the audience rather than letting it be revealed through the characters, visuals, and action. So too much exposition is just tedious. And often on our show, it would be around the kitchen table when everybody would be explaining about some new person who's come to town or what different characters were trying to accomplish, what their challenge or goal was, who was having a problem. So again, it, it sort of tells you what's gonna be happening, but sometimes it just gets a little too on the nose, which is the next term. And my husband finally figured out what that was. And so now he'll go, oh, that was too on the nose, right? Which means writing the obvious. Uh, so you have a group of uh, cowboys riding along, it's a posse and they see tracks in the ground, they're tracking something. And we see the tracks on the ground and we've seen the people they're chasing. So rather than the, the audience clearly at this point goes, oh, there's the tracks, they're going that way. We know what's happening. Somebody instead says, oh, there's tracks on the ground. I bet they're going and they're going that direction. They must have gone that direction. Stating the obvious. So on the nose writing, not a good thing. Okay, you need to be a little more creative than that. Uh, then stakes. What's at stake for the characters? Why are they doing what they're doing? This is a question for both the writer and for the actors in approaching the story. So whenever I'm auditioning or I'm doing something, that's one of the first things I want to determine is what's at stake for my character? Why is what is going on important to them? Um, is it only casually important? In which case their stakes aren't very high and it might not be that interesting for the audience. If the character doesn't care and doesn't really want it, then it's hard to convince the audience that they should care. So having high stakes when you're writing something for characters and when you're making choices as an actor are both very important. Uh, along then, I, I just thought, we talk a lot about themes and different stories have different sorts of themes. So some examples of some common themes that you will see in film and television and theater, uh, a coming of age. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. You've got a young person who has a pivotal point in their life, something that's going to, uh, they're gonna grow up in that moment. Uh, for me on the Waltons, it was maybe when Mary Ellen, the, the episode, The Nurse, when she went through a difficult thing with a family where she was helping out nursing and the mom died and the children were left there and she she had to grow up in that moment so that was a little mini coming of age moment there so different shows different uh films have that as its core theme uh, a buddy story you know two friends two buddies you know and sometimes those are combined with a road trip uh so you have two people uh that you know, take some sort of a trip together or it's about their relationship together. Even something like the musical Wicked could be considered a buddy story because Elphaba and Glinda become buddies and how does that work? Uh, so that might be that they become buddies or it could be two people who are buddies who go through some crisis together. Uh, revenge, again, obvious. Something's happened, Somebody wants revenge and it's all about, is that going to happen and how is it gonna happen? Uh, redemption, uh, you know, those can, be, those can be underdog stories. Those can be somebody who's fallen on hard times, somebody who's had a serious comeuppance and now it's an opportunity for them to turn that around. Uh, so redemption stories, good versus evil. Those can be Westerns, those can be space, um, those can be, you know, like Marvel comic movies. Uh, those are all kind of black hat, white hat sort of thing. Good versus evil. Man versus nature. So all of your catastrophe movies, you know, things uh, with, you know, force of nature, or there's an earthquake, or there's a typhoon coming, or there's a volcano eruption. Man versus nature, or somebody being stuck out in the desert, and how are they going to cross this desert without dying? 
uh, man versus nature. So those are some things relative to writing and decisions that writers make. Since there's so many of these things to take up, uh, I'm going to break them in this into a couple of parts. So next time I will take up in part two a lot of the lingo connected with film. People have asked me about different uh, different crew positions and things like that. Uh, so in part two, I will take up more of the lingo connected with being on a film set. So I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.